The next item of business is debate on motion 15615 in the name of Liam Kerr on tackling antisocial behaviour. May I ask those who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Liam Kerr to speak to and move the motion for up to eight minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, we rightly spend a great deal of time in this chamber discussing high-profile crimes. But we rarely discuss something more low-level, but which can nevertheless be devastating in its own way, and which can have a major impact on the quality of people's lives, the cohesion of their communities, and the immunity of the space in which they live. And that is antisocial behaviour. Presiding Officer, we've all experienced this at one time or another, uh, people coming into the garden or the stair and relieving themselves or smoking. The guy so drunk he can't stand shouting at kids. Uh, the neighbours blasting out music that reverberates the floor. The, the window of the community centre being panned yet again. Your local corner shop being tagged with spray paint. Coming out the next morning to find every car in the row keyed. Now I've actually witnessed all of these incidents in recent months in Aberdeen. Which is not surprising because statistics show there are around 41 incidents of antisocial behaviour per day in Aberdeen. In fact, throughout Scotland, there are nearly 1,000 incidents of antisocial behaviour every day. And those are just the ones reported to the police. That is over 340,000 antisocial behaviour incidents last year. And it's increasing. The overall number is up 5%. Disturbances, up 9%. Noise incidents, up 5%. Vandalism, up 5%. Presiding officer, these are not the big ticket issues. They don't make the evening news headlines. But make no mistake, these kinds of incidents on a repeated and escalating basis are inconvenient for some, aggravating for others, but debilitating and terrifying for many. Lying there each night knowing the music will probably come on at some point, so even if it doesn't, you can't relax or listening as you hear the muted conversations on the corner outside your window, punctuated by the smashing glass. We also know from the Crime and Justice Survey that deprived communities still suffer the most from crimes like vandalism, litter and property crimes. And if we allow this to continue unchecked, we're telling communities they do not deserve to live free of this low-level intimidation and disruption, that they are not worthy of a safe and stress-free environment, and that we will continue to allow their community cohesion to suffer while sending a signal that more serious criminal activity will similarly go unchecked. Yes. Maureen Watt. I thank the member for giving way. Will he uh, join me in congratulating organisations like Street Soccer, run by RGU in Aberdeen, who will go into areas where, uh, with the, uh, in conjunction with the police, into areas where uh, they are experiencing that type of antisocial behaviour he describes? Liam Kerr. Yes, absolutely. I will congratulate that organisation. I'm very familiar with the work that they do in Aberdeen, and I've no doubt there are many such organisations throughout Scotland that are worthy of merit. But I do think that we do need to try something new to arrest the fact that such behaviour is rising. Because we are telling the elderly, the parents with young children, the night shift worker trying to sleep during the day that the impact on them, on their community, on their health of antisocial behaviour is not important enough to be dealt with. Now we don't think this is being taken seriously enough and I hope that by backing our motion today the other parties will show that they agree. Presiding officer, since 2004, under the Antisocial Behaviour Act, police officers have the power to impose a fixed penalty notice to people aged 16 and over who are behaving in an antisocial way. There are three key advantages to an on-the-spot fine. It is a swift and effective punishment for low-level antisocial and nuisance offending. It's a highly visible deterrent to others, and it frees up police officers to spend more time on our streets dealing with perhaps more serious crimes. It is a fine of £50, payable within 28 days, failing which it will go up to £75 and become a court debt. Once paid, the matter is over. A short, sharp shock with no criminal record attached. Fixed penalty notices are an important tool forming part of a wide range of powers which enable the police and local authorities to exercise judgment when tackling antisocial behaviour. 
the words of Ash Denham, the minister, just last week. And I agree that antisocial behaviour is rising, whilst at the same time fixed penalty notices have declined by 75%, from around 55,000 in 2013-14 to around 11,000 last year. There seems to be a disconnect, and the motion which I move in my name seeks to provide a solution. President officer, in England and Wales, they have a similar scheme with a crucial difference. Penalty offences are divided into lower and upper tier offences depending on seriousness and attract penalties of £60 and £90 respectively. In Northern Ireland, there's a two-tier system. The fine is £45 or £85 depending on severity. Briefly, please, Mr Johnson. Daniel Johnson. I think the member makes good points, but I was wondering if you'd acknowledge the fact that it's not necessarily simply a cost benefit and, and an increase may disproportionately impact those who are least able to afford it. Liam Kerr. I, I don't know that it uh, will automatically disproportionately impact, but I do think that the member is starting to raise uh, an important point. And I note the amendment that the member has put in to the motion, which I think there is merit. And I'll listen to the debate as we go through, but I think in principle, the points that he's going to make are supportable uh, by the Scottish Conservative Party this afternoon. In Scotland, there was a review of fixed penalty notices which concluded that whilst police felt that having them gave greater opportunities to deal with antisocial behaviour, the existing fines are insufficient for more serious behaviour. So my motion is a simple proposition which I think can remind those communities blighted by antisocial behaviour that this Parliament has not abandoned them and simply ask Parliament to support the principle of an increased penalty for those incidents of antisocial behaviour which are more serious. Now looking at the English model, this might include things like possession of and throwing fireworks or breaching a fireworks curfew. And I know that the Minister's concerned about this, so this is a solution. Criminal damage of less than £300, minor shoplifting on a first offence, selling alcohol to an under 18. And I know Daniel Johnson is rightly concerned about shop workers, so this is a solution. This will ensure more crime can be punished, direct swift justice is delivered to low-level offenders, ensuring a direct link between offence and punishment, and it's a more effective deterrent than we currently have. Now, for the purposes of debate, I've suggested, I really can't, I'm in my last minute, Minister. I've suggested that whilst the 50 pound baseline is retained, the more serious tier be fixed at 100 pounds. A basis on the rest of the UK, and I genuinely believe there's a more deterrent value, but I would be interested to hear members' views on whether, they, uh, whether that's the appropriate level. Presiding officer, everyone deserves to live in a safe community free from the menace of vandalism, noise, disruptive drunken behaviour. A higher level of fixed penalty notice for more serious antisocial behaviour is a straightforward piece of secondary legislation which gives constables on the ground the tools they need, delivers instant justice for victims and communities to counter the feeling that low-level offending is ignored and ensures a strong, immediate link between the behaviour and the punishment. And perhaps most importantly, given that it is often the most vulnerable, such as the elderly, who are most intimidated by antisocial behaviour, we will send a signal that we will protect those people from the behaviour that blights their communities. Presiding officer, by increasing the fixed penalty notice for the worst antisocial behaviour, it is time to make the fine fit the crime. Thank you. Uh, that's all very well, Mr Kerr, but would you like to move the motion? <laughs> I move the motion in my name, presiding officer. I now call on Ash Denham to speak to and move Amendment 15615.2. Thank you, Up to six officer. minutes. The Scotland that I want to see is where everyone, regardless of background, is able to live in peace, feeling safe in their homes and communities, and being able to raise our families in secure environments, free from the threat of abuse, fear, harassment, or intimidation. I don't want to see anybody caught up in any form of antisocial behaviour. And as a citizen, I don't want my family or my community to be subjected to it either. None of us do. And that is why the Scottish Government and its partner organisations are keen to continue to deliver effective ways of tackling antisocial behaviour and also its causes. Effectively tackling antisocial behaviour requires a partnership approach with Police Scotland, local authorities and court services all playing a central role in delivering positive outcomes in communities right across Scotland. And there is much truth in the old adage that prevention is better than cure, and that is why we must never lose sight of the fact that prevention activities, including early interventions, must work hand in hand with robust criminal justice legislation. We've seen evidence of a long-term 
sustained reduction in the experiences and in the perceptions of antisocial behaviour in communities across Scotland. And this is reflected in the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey, which shows that the percentage of adults who think people behave in an antisocial manner in their local area has fallen from 46% in 2008-9 to just 29% in 2016-17. And the estimated percentage of adults who've actually experienced vandalism has also almost halved between 2008-9 and 2016-17. And I'll take the intervention. Liam Kerr. Yeah, I thank the Minister for taking the intervention. That's perceptions, Minister. You've got to go out into communities and find out what's really happening on the ground, where, frankly, people are still experiencing this. Do you not agree with that? Ash Denham. The, all the evidence suggests that there is a long-term sustained reduction in all crime in Scotland, including antisocial behaviour. All the evidence. And the member would be wise to look at the data on this, and he would see that for himself. However, we are not complacent and remain absolutely committed to ensuring that our justice partners have the powers to further reduce antisocial behaviour. And it's absolutely vital that we continue to build on the diversionary and preventative work undertaken over the last decade, work that develops the skills and resilience of our young people and helps to make, them, um, to make better positive life choices. So since 2008, we've committed 92 million to the Cash Back for Communities and other community initiatives, delivering nearly 2 million activities and opportunities for young people across all 32 local authorities in Scotland. £17 million from Cash Back for Communities has been committed for the period of 2017 up until 2020, with a focus on tackling inequalities and providing opportunities to raise the attainment, ambition and aspirations of young people from areas of deprivation across Scotland. We've also invested over £3.4 million since 2009 for delivery of the No Knives, Better Lives campaign um, and programme. This programme is informed by and complementary to wider youth diversionary interventions and activities that aim to prevent antisocial behaviour and offending occurring in the first place. The Mentors in Violence Prevention programme is currently being developed in 140 schools across 22 local authorities, helping to lead young people to more positive destinations. And where young people are involved in or at risk of offending, we remain committed to an integrated whole system approach, tackling deeds whilst also taking account of wider needs. And this approach is driving improvements. And in order to support our continued commitment to early intervention to prevent offending, to cut reoffending, and to keep young people out of formal systems as far as possible, We've also committed 1.6 million over two years for all local authorities in Scotland to support, renew and extend the whole system approach, allowing for continued partnership working and strengthening links between youth justice, community justice, education, the third sector and children's services, as well as, where possible, extending the whole system approach to young people aged 21 and to up to the age of 26 for care experienced young people. And this funding is making a real difference in communities. I'll give away. Jamie Green. I, I thank the Minister, and I hear everything the Minister's saying, but I haven't heard a single reason, not one single reason, why you do not support the concept of a higher penalty for more serious offences. Could you please uh, furnish us with some detail as to why you don't support the motion? Ash Denham. Well, the first thing I would say is that fixed penalty notices are only one part of an integrated approach in our justice system. And there's no evidence uh, at the excuse me. to suggest that a higher um, a penalty notice would have the desired effect that the members are seeking. I would say that we are always listening to our justice partners and uh, we keep this under review and we will speak to them about this and we will um, ask them, because they are the experts in this, as to whether it's something that they would consider. At the moment, we have no plans to raise it, but we will keep it under review. Presiding officer, for example, in Fife, a social work assistant is being employed to make connections with schools, strengthening the operational links between those schools and Fife's diversion group. And in South Ayrshire, the money will be used to extend their garden project, which is targeted at young people aged 15 to 18 and up to 26 years old for care experienced young people who are at risk of offending or have been engaged in low level offending. These young people are learning new and transferable skills, um, like how to communicate better in a group, how to work together in a team. Skills that will support these young people as they move to positive adulthood. So while fixed penalty notices are an important tool 
in our response to antisocial behaviour, they form only a part of the wide range of powers that already exist to tackle antisocial and criminal behaviour. And um, our approach is robust, it's holistic, and we will continue to build on this to deliver the Scotland that we all want to see. And yet again, that's all very well, but would you like to move your amendment? Um, formally moved, Madam <laughs> Officer. I now call on Daniel Johnson, our time lucky. Thank to speak you, Deputy Officer. And I will start by moving 1, 5, the amendment. 15615.3. And I Mr. move Johnson. that very amendment <laughs> in my name. Um, I, I think this is an important debate for actually very much the reasons that Liam Kerr set out in his opening speech. While much of the time when we talk about crime in this place, it's the, the big crimes, very often it's actually the lowest level activities which have the biggest impacts in our communities. So I think it's right that we examine the measures that we have to tackle these things. But also I, I very much agree with many of the sentiments that the Minister set out. I think Ash Denham is absolutely right. We must focus on prevention because ultimately that is the way that we reduce crime. But it's very much the approach that Labour took in its time in government and indeed antisocial behaviour orders in, uh, uh, were, were established by the last Labour government and I would uh, argue are very much a, a key component of the many reasons and the multiple factors, both these and beyond these, why we have observed a long-term decrease in crime. But we can have no complacency, which is why I think we need to look at this. So um, while we support the broad thrust of this motion, we do have reservations about it, which I'll detail later on. But if we look at antisocial behaviour itself, these are problematic behaviours, ranging from behaviours which we might characterise as neighbours from hell through to littering, youth nu nuisance, um, drunken and disorderly behaviour, vandalism. And these can have real impacts in our communities. And indeed, my colleague Claire Baker will set out some specific issues that she faces in her area. And the key characteristics of these, these are behaviours which may be low level, below the threshold of criminality, but they have a much wider disruption and more importantly can lead to a context that does lead to wider criminality, both in terms of the, the context that providers, provides, but also in terms of the individual, that these can be precursor behaviours that go on to criminality. That's why we do need to equip our police with the tools that they need to make those early interventions so that they can intervene on, uh, with behaviour before it reaches that criminal threshold, but no, nonetheless is problematic. Indeed, what we must have is a, a robust approach to crime, but that we must also have a robust approach to tackling those underlying issues. Or if I could quote a certain former uh, Labour Shadow Home Secretary, we must be tough on crime, but also tough on the causes of crime. But that approach very often overly focuses on that first element of that phrase. And we must look at the causes and look at those causes, both in terms of the social impacts, which I'll go into in a moment, but also the evidence. And I think the evidence is an important part here because these are uh, orders which are, are widely used. They are effective as far as we can tell. Indeed, 50% of police disposals um, uh, are uh, 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 of this antisocial uh, behavior. But we do lack a kind of clear evidence in terms of the, the uh, impact that they have in detail. And indeed, we have seen recent declines. And I think I would urge the government to have a, 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 a more in-depth look at why that has been declining and whether or not we could improve them. But the most recent uh, study that we have uh, is the Scottish Government Review into fixed penalty notices in 2009. And indeed, the police reported that they felt they were useful and proportionate. And indeed, 83% uh, of the responses uh, from the police said that they save time. So from that perspective, they are clearly, they, they are, have a role and that they are effective, but I think we do need further evidence. Which brings me to the, the Conservative motion. As I have alluded to, I do believe it has merit, but it is narrow. It overly focuses on one particular measure. And I think, as the, the Minister pointed out, and I would certainly agree, we need to look at a broad range of measures if we are going to tackle these behaviours and tackle them early. But we must also look at the context. And I think it is hard to uh, escape from the conclusion that poverty has a clear and direct impact on many of the behaviours that we are looking. And I think we do have a danger of compounding those if we simply increase uh, the penalties that are set without any uh, uh, reference to that wider context. 
You know, there is no evidence that crime is simply a cost-benefit calculation by criminals. I think that's a very dangerous assumption. So we have to look at other measures and we have to look at causes. That's why uh, our amendment uh, acknowledges the role of these uh, uh, measures, but also looks to, to examine a wider context and to consider those things in the round. And in particular, I wanted to highlight diversion tactics and policies which can be used by the police. And whether those are diversion uh, tactics around housing, the da Dundee Families Project and the Shelter Inclusion Project are very good examples where police use powers to divert families towards those sorts of services or in drugs. And in England and Wales, there's some very good practice, and even in Somerset and Thames Valley, where, where people are directed towards drug counselling and other services to divert people away from those behaviours, and indeed other diversion strategies around social services. Likewise, the government has please. many merits, and I'll, I'll, I'll conclude. Uh, however, I, I am, uh, given that it, it preempts mine, we will not be supporting it as it votes, but if it passes, we will be supporting uh, at uh, decision time. So we must give police the tools, but we must also acknowledge the causes and context within which these behaviours take place. Thank you. John Finney, four minutes, please. Um, thank you very much indeed, President Officer. I, I think this is a timely debate. Antisocial behaviour blights all of our communities, and, and I certainly understand that and the impact it can have on a number of people. And I think there's a role for all of us to play in relation to that. With regard to the police, the primary function of the police, of course, is to guard, watch and patrol to prevent crime. And I, I think a visible police presence and active citizens supporting the police is, a, is an important thing, that has to be said. I, I do wonder what it is... Um, uh, the Conservative, uh, my colleague uh, Liam Kerr, is trying to achieve uh, in, in res respect of the uh, motion and indeed what the gauge of success will. If he maybe lets me build on the, on the issue, I'll, I'll explain why. I have in front of me here a, a fixed penalty notice. And can I tell you... Uh, yeah, no? It's, 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 one, it's one of a range I could have called on. It doesn't actually have have my, my name on the top, but if I say a couple of important phrases out of this notice, <clears throat> excuse me please, this allows, acceptance of the notice, this allows for the matter to be concluded by way of a, a fixed penalty, to be concluded. Any liability for conviction of the offence is discharged, now people would understand that, and then goes on to say no discussion or review of the facts of this case can thereafter take place. Now, that contrasts with the situation where, um, if the matter were reported, uh, of course there's a role for antisocial behaviour orders, but when, for instance, um, um, Mr Kerr said he talked about repeated offences, well, if someone repeats an offence, if someone refuses to desist from offence, the appropriate action is for a police officer to arrest them, and you'll understand that. Escalating. Escalating, again, there's an opportunity for intervention. Um, there, there's particular methods, and these are some of the things I picked up from Mr Kerr's speech when he talked about deprived communities suffering the most. And I would align myself with uh, uh, Daniel uh, Johnson's comments in relation to that. And that's a wee bit askew with the, 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 the notion about community cohesion. Community cohesion requires us all working closely together. Now, so when Mr Kerr talks about trying something new, there is nothing new in this. And indeed, from a couple of the parties, I heard rehash of old phrases um, from, from past campaigns. There's nothing new um, in trying to deal with issues of drunkenness and deal with issues of addiction. And the very notion that what you would do with someone in a drunken state is try and reason with them and hand them a bit of paper and that they would have some regard to the penalty that come from that, I, I simply think isn't the case. So I'm very supportive. Yes, of course. Liam Kerr. I understand the point being made, and I, I, do, I do hear that, but it, this would be new to Scotland because, of course, in the rest of the UK, we've got a two-tier system. We don't have that here. Does the member not agree that it's definitely worth trying because it's only secondary legislation, after all? John Finney. No, the member doesn't agree with that. I, I, I think had this been about looking how we uprate the, the, the option, as, as we could with the, the, the scale of fees for fines, that might be something. But the reality of the situation is someone uh, that is uh, under the influence of drink or drugs is not going to be influenced by the fact that it's two figures with a pine sound beside uh, written on a note or, or three figures. The reality is we have to deal with things differently. Now, the tremendous thing that's changed from my days in the police is rather than we try and resolve something there and then, so with domestic abuse, take the offender out, it's a problem-solving approach that's adopted. The problem-solving approach isn't to go to someone and have this piece of paper saying that's the matter concluded. 
Often there are underlying reasons connected with us. These reasons may well be about addictions, about the pressures, poverty, as we've heard. So I don't think this is the way. I don't think this. What is the way is some of the, the routes that were suggested by the Minister about some of the great community campaigns, which Mr Kerr acknowledged have a role to play in this. So I think that's the direction of travel. Um, uh, and we had an amendment which wasn't taken, which was along the lines of um, Daniel Johnson, which is it's very important these issues and these uh, schemes are properly resourced. So um, we will be supporting the government, but not the, the Conservative motion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Finney. And I call Liam MacArthur. Thanks, uh, President Officer. I, I would also like to uh, thank Liam Kerr for bringing forward this uh, helpful uh, debate, um, not least in allowing John Finney to come clean about his past history of fixed penalty notices. Uh, but I very much agreed with uh, much of what John Finney had to say. I think we all uh, agree that where antisocial behaviour burdens or indeed blights uh, the communities, our justice system needs to be equipped uh, to handle it appropriately. I, I'm also grateful for the opportunity to reiterate for the record my thanks to the police, local authority staff and the many organisations that exist the length and breadth of the country for the work that they do to combat uh, antisocial behaviour. Every day officers uh, are confronted with complex judgment calls drawing on their training experience and discretion. Fixed penalty notices are part of their toolkit. Indeed until recently uh, they were so significant that they were far and away the most widely utilised police disposal. The rationale for the popularity was clear. Both the police and prosecution services could save valuable time and scarce resources by administering an on-the-spot find. Uh, five years after fixed penalty notices were created, time savings were described by officers as, quote, the most apparent and significant benefit of FPNNs. But of course, diverting people from our courts doesn't only free up time, as Daniel Johnson and others have, have, uh, have uh, referred to, and as the men, uh, amendments uh, accepted today suggest. They recognise the value of early intervention, preventative and diversity measures, uh, raising the age of criminal responsibility as well. Where possible, keeping people away from court in the first place is the best way to avoid them descending into repeat offending behaviour. So, presiding officer, the rationale and evidence for fixed penalty notices uh, is clear. Others have spoken about the context, but I think it does bear repeating. Reports of many uh, offences, in a second, offences uh, covered by fixed penalty notices have decreased. Data published just yesterday showed recordings of breach of the peace have reduced by 43% in the last 10 years. Drunkenness and other disorderly conduct fell uh, by 72%, uh, and other figures follow a similar suit. Liam Kerr. Thank you. I'll be very brief. Just uh, if you accept the principle of uh, the fixed penalty notices, do you accept the principle that uh, we should have two tiers and put it up? Liam I'll come Carson. to the point about increasing the, the, um, the, the fixed penalty notices because I share, the, I, I think, the um, uncertainty that a number of colleagues have expressed about where precisely the Conservatives are wanting to go with this motion. Officers appear to be moving towards more lenient disposals. Fixed penalty notices have reduced. Recorded police warnings have been introduced. And this option was described by Police Scotland as, quote, the first step in a three-tiered disposal process. So that tiering uh, already exists. There are important considerations in this context, in this debate. It's not to say that we shouldn't be keeping matters under review, but I'm unclear as to the purpose uh, precisely of what the Conservative motion is calling for. Is the proposal to apply a higher penalty in every case to reflect that some of them are, quote, more serious? Or does it propose a two-tier system with a range of fine levels uh, within it? If so, where would the line be drawn for malicious behaviour, breaking alcohol bylaws or persistent, uh, persistent uh, singing? There would need to be transparency and predictability. And at what point does a low-level antisocial offence become a serious low-level antisocial offence? Because the purpose of fixed penalty notices is to be an on-the-spot fine for a minor offence. If behaviour fell into a new, more serious grouping, then police officers already have the discretion and power to escalate matters, referring someone, for example, to the procurator fiscal. President officer, as I said earlier, there is value in review and reflection. I'm not opposed to a higher level of fixed penalty notices. Certainly, um, they should be uh, enabled to keep pace with the rate of inflation. If there is an argument for increases, then it will be borne out in consultation and discussion with the professionals on the front line. However, at this point, it seems that more evidence is required before Parliament commits itself to what the Conservatives are proposing. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call Maurice Corrie to be followed by Runa Mackay. Maurice Corrie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I welcome our party's business debate today, and I also fully support uh, Liam Kerr's motion 
Antisocial behaviour is a worrying and rising problem in Scotland. We must recognise its impact on our communities, and for this is how we work out the best solutions. With my role in community, community safety, I am keenly aware of the challenges of antisocial behaviour. Incidents of harassment, abuse, bullying and vandalism are far more uncommon. They are everyday currencies. They are seeing a rise in neighbour disputes and a rise in noise complaints and a rise in disturbances. We cannot underestimate how much this makes people feel. If these offences are ongoing, think of the impact they have on mental health. Antisocial behaviour creates victims out of an ordinary person who have asked for no trouble at all. While it can start, while it can st where it can start small, it can easily escalate into a more serious and offensive behaviour. At its worst, it threatens a sense of community. And for the elderly especially, this can make them feel more vulnerable and isolated. And for those in deprived areas, these disturbances can seem just like a fact of life. In my own area, I have seen the frustration of the fear this problem can cause. In Western Bartonshire, there are over 7,000 antisocial behaviour incidents reported in 2017-18. That means, on average, there are 20 incidents a day in this area alone. Yet, in the same time frame, just a total of three antisocial behaviour orders were issued. Furthermore, its local council, controlled by the SNP, hasn't updated its strategy since 2009. And how can that be acceptable? Having a current strategy will answer these offences with a relevant and powerful approach. And therefore, for me, the incidences themselves are not the sole problem. Often the lack of a strong and robust response to this behaviour can worsen the situation. There is another problem in itself. To make our communities truly safer, we need a greater police presence. We cannot deny that our police force is stretched. The pressure they face as police numbers dwindle is surely a warning sign. And without these resources, antisocial behaviour can't be tackled to the extent that it could be. Nuisance... Sorry. Nu uh, nuisance offenders uh, can escape through the cracks. I know this frustrates our police officers just as much as it does our communities. It is disappointing to see that the number of special constables have halved in the last five years since the beginning of Police Scotland under the SNP. From the veterans' perspective... Yes, I will give way. Um, so the facts of the matter are that actually in the last 10 years in Scotland, police numbers are up 5.6%, but in England, under the Conservatives, they're down 13.8%. Maurice Corey. Uh, they may be up in Scotland, Minister, but the fact is there are far too many on the administrative role and not out on operations facing the facts. From the veterans' perspective, I know that this pathway can be of great benefit, not just to the veterans themselves, but to the local area as a whole. The visibility and presence of these officers provide right at the heart of our communities is invaluable, and our police force is stronger with their assistance. For our constituents, uh, a greater police presence will go a long way to make them feel safer and more secure, and with antisocial behaviour on the rise, surely this is an obvious move. Yes, I'll give way. Uh, uh, Bob Doris. For Thank you, Member, for, for giving away. I wonder if the Member could tell us how much more money the Conservatives would spend on Police Scotland, where that money would come from, and whether that means the Conservatives will now cancel their tax cuts. Mr Corey, but you've only got half a minute to do so. We obviously will see what the budget debate comes forward uh, tomorrow and what's said on the other side and with the case that we put forward. But what we're saying is put the money where it matters, and that is on the street. In other words, we see more police presence. <laughs> And to equip these police officers, we need an increased penalty uh, notice, fixed no uh, penalty notice. As we have heard, the number being issued is at an all-time low, and these fines seem to be the best way to stop offenders in their tracks. It allows police officers to take swift action against more serious behaviour. It meets justice and can be delivered on the streets, a clear and quick deterrent that matches the crime. And of course, early intervention would be ideal in stopping antisocial behaviour from happening in the first place. But we are talking about how it should be dealt with once the harm has already been done. And for the victims of such crime, it's important that they get fair justice they deserve. For, for their sake, I hope the government will encourage this move. And to conclude, presiding officer, antisocial behaviour goes further than being a nuisance. It is simply not right that our communities can feel less safe nor listened to. It is an injustice if these offences go unchecked and with the most up-to-date strategy in place linked with fines which tackle the crime on the spot, I believe is the best way forward and it is how we can make our communities a safer and better places to be. Thank you. Thank you. I call Rona Mackay to be followed by Claire Baker. Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, at the start of my contribution to this debate, I'd like to say something which I believe can achieve consensus right across the Chamber 
Police Scotland do a fantastic job keeping us safe and fighting crime and we owe them a huge debt of thanks. So the Conservative motion today asked Parliament to support a higher level of fixed penalty notice for more serious antisocial behaviour. But like John Finney and Liam MacArthur, I'm a little puzzled as to the detail of this motion or where the evidence is that a higher level of fixed penalty notice would reduce offending or reoffending. Liam Kerr's uh, motion uh, advocates doubling the on-the-spot fine from 50 to 100 pounds for more serious offences which are not deemed serious enough to go to court. But my questions are, how and who defines how serious these offences are if they're not going to court? Is that jump judgment simply down to the police dealing with the incident? And if so, who, who would monitor this? Is this not another responsibility to impose on our hard-working officers? Of course, presiding officer, <laughs> I agree that antisocial behaviour is distressing and causes chaos in daily lives and communities. The type of behaviour that ranges from neighbour disputes to, uh, to vandalism and everything in between, as Liam Kerr and, and Daniel Johnson outlined. But given that a large proportion of these crimes are caused by young people who may have lost their way or are facing adversity in deprived communities, they simply may not be in a position to pay 50 pounds far less 100 pounds and I agree with uh, Daniel Johnson on, on his comments on this. Having said that the figures released today from the Howard League Scotland indicate that the number of young people becoming involved in the justice system is reducing not just in Scotland but globally which is very welcome news. Presiding officer I, I do believe early intervention starting with education in school is uh, one way to reduce antisocial behaviour as well as a change of culture to encourage a culture of respect among adults to stop and look at the selfish way they're behaving which upsets people and if we attempt to find out why adults why people adults or children act out in this way it may help us to reduce incidences of antisocial behaviour and well fixed yes Care. Uh, very briefly, does Rona Mackay think it's acceptable that SNP-run Glasgow Council's latest antisocial behaviour strategy is dated 2005 to 2008? Rona Mackay. Well, uh, I, I, I think the figures have to speak for themselves. I mean, we are, we are tackling... The, 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 the initiatives outlined by the Minister shows that we are tackling the causes of antisocial behaviour. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that that's, an, that's, an, that's entirely relevant. So well fixed penalty notices are important, they're just part of a wider range of powers and initiatives to tackle anti-social anti behaviour. Presiding officer, I'm pleased to say that in my constituency in Eastern Bartonshire, unlike Liam Kerr's, crime is, right, is down right across the board with reports of anti-social behaviour down 4% per from last year. I hope this trend continues and I can commend the work done by our local, local officers. Presiding officer, the 2018-19 draft Scottish budget increases funding for police services by around 25 million compared with previous years. Of course, this is helped by the change to the VAT status, meaning we're not unfairly charged, but back payment of 175 million would be a considerable boost to the budget. And we'll continue to put pressure on Westminster to return this to us. Presiding officer, uh, budgets and stats are for politicians and, and I recognise that people are more concerned about the reality of life in the streets and I agree we should be doing everything we can to reduce antisocial behaviour. I'm just not convinced this is the way to do it. We are on the correct tra trajectory when it comes to dealing with crime in Scotland. It can never be eradicated, but if we have a dedicated and professional force producing encouraging results, we are on the right track. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Claire Baker to be followed by Richard Lyle. Claire Baker. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in today's debate. Um, antisocial behaviour is a blight on too many communities and causes significant disruption to people's lives. Today's debate is a welcome opportunity to tackle and consider how we tackle such behaviour in ways which are effective, proportionate and preventative. I want to raise a particular issue that illustrates the challenges we face in addressing antisocial behaviour. In recent years we have seen an increase in the popularity of off-road vehicles such as quad bikes and scramblers, partly because it is easier and cheaper to buy them online and from overseas. I appreciate that riding quad bikes and dirt bikes is exciting, but those buying them must appreciate that there are restrictions. The DVLA is reserved, but consideration should be given to the need for these vehicles to be registered and insured with appropriate consequences, such as destruction or confiscation of the vehicle, if there is a failure to comply. The influx of vehicles has coincided with a rise in irresponsible behaviour, and that cannot go unchallenged. We have seen in Fife, particularly around the Leavenmouth and Kirkcaldy areas, um, residents being put at risk in their own streets. 
There has been the death of a much-loved pet, dangerous riding in parks and woodland walks, which is putting the rider and citizens at risk, and thousands of pounds worth of damage to local farmland as riders trespass on private property. We cannot let such irresponsible antisocial behaviour continue. I have been campaigning for some time for clearer rules and regulations so that those who are using off-road bikes understand the risks they are taking and the laws that they are breaking. I've argued for investment into diversionary activity and for the police to have the full range of powers to enable them to tackle this problem. For many riders, it is an ignorance of the law, but for others, there is a criminality involved. Bike theft is a feature with, at its height, an average of one vehicle stolen every eight days in Fife. I have worked closely with the local police and I would like to highlight the work of Inspector Tom Brown and the team in Leavenmouth who have worked hard alongside the local community to tackle such antisocial behaviour. 32 bikes have been seized in Leavenmouth to date and last year 21 people were charged with the illegal use of off-road bikes in the area. However, the police still face significant challenges. In a recent interview with a local paper, Inspector Brown made clear that such behaviour on quad bikes and similar vehicles are a threat to public safety before raising concerns that someone will be killed by the illegal use of motorbikes and legislation needs to be reflected, to, need to be changed to reflect that. We cannot wait until there's a serious or even fatal accident in the area before we take necessary action. So the current court system of issuing fines and points on a driving licence is a time-consuming and a lengthy process and it's not always relevant to the culprit. We should be looking to provide the police with more options, including enabling fixed penalty notices to be issued to these riders, which would be a more immediate police response reflecting the crime. Um, I raised this issue with the Minister in the Chamber just before Christmas and I appreciate the productive meeting we had together this morning. I am meeting with the police and other partners in Fife tomorrow and I hope that going forward we are able to work together to tackle this issue. Ultimately, safety is of paramount concern. Safety for the rider, but also safety for local residents. As both amendments highlight, fixed penalty notices and punishment can only be part of the solution. We must ensure early intervention addresses the root causes and tackles the activity before it becomes criminal. That's why I'd like to highlight the work of Kingdom Off-Road Motorcycle Club. Working in Leaving Mouth, they provide diversionary programmes and offer a safe and professional environment for off-road track users. Their work in the area is vital if we are to raise awareness of responsible riding and prevent antisocial behaviour. They are seeking support and funding to build an indoor track to ensure riders have access all year round. They have had support from the local authority, from the police and from funding bodies such as the Lottery to support their diversionary work, but this is always a challenge. To tackle antisocial behaviour, we must look at innovative solutions to the problems we face alongside considering changes to legislation. And that's why I'll be supporting the Labour amendment this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. I call Richard Lyle to be followed by thank Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, President Officer. If the Tories had thought that, that this was really important, they were uh, uh, allocated more time. I would like to begin by reflecting on the wider issue today because fixed penalties for antisocial behaviour are a part of a wider gambit of powers and activity which our police service delivers in order to give our communities feeling and feeling safe. A priority which this SNP government are utterly committed to in terms of supporting that work and building communities safely. Of course, this is a priority which we see time and time again being recognised as we reflect on our record. With one of the lowest crime levels since 1974, more police on the streets, not less like England. So in reflecting on the call today, we must recognise that whilst penalty notice are an important tool, no tool for tackling antisocial behaviour, they absolutely form part of a wider range of powers and initiatives. Police and local authorities already have that range of options available when tackling antisocial behaviour and importantly they have the ability to exercise discretion and judgment when using these options. This government, I know, supports work to reduce the damage caused by antisocial behaviour, tackling the symptoms, investing in prevention. For example, the Cashback for Communities Initiative funds a wide range of projects, facilities throughout Scottish communities, including those experiencing antisocial behaviour. Since 2008, the Scottish Government has committed £92 million for cash back for communities. This type of diversity work and pre preventive spending is an effective tool in terms of addressing some of the concerns which the Conservative members raise. That said, the Government have stated that there is ongoing discussions with Police Scotland and local authorities to provide opportunity for them to explore options. 
But we must be careful because there are unintended, unintended consequences of what appear to be a quick fix. For example, people committing low-level antisocial behaviour could be given fines they can't afford to pay and therefore get caught up in the justice system. And we don't want this for people we represent. We need a proportionate and balanced approach. In my opinion, presiding officer, increasing fines is an easy fix. And I'm afraid to say it's a usual conservative headline grabbing approach because we have a Tory party who wants to reduce income tax, but then increase fines. Short, sharp, shock, an old Tory saying, I wonder where I heard that before. Is this a new way of raising revenue? I would really be interested in hearing about the Conservative wider justice policy, and they should have given more time to discuss it, rather than this approach today, or don't they want to talk about it? Because it isn't a simple issue. I served as a councillor on North Lancashire Council for decades. They're only trying to do as they've done to Mr Blackford down in uh, uh, Westminster. It won't work with me. It's one of the first... I was one of the first to have a, a dedicated anti-social task force department. And I can tell the Chamber, justifying anti-social behaviour takes a lot of work, needs more investigation, direct involvement by both council staff and police. Presiding officer, the headline grabbing motion, the Tories want to get tougher and introducing more fines to, gra to grab the right wing press. B, but a competent approach, it does not make. As far as I'm concerned, presiding officer, we on these benches will continue to have dialogue, ensure that we work with our partner agencies to have a comprehensive approach to tackle not only anti-social behaviour but crime across the board. And I'm very glad that I've upset the Tory party this afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. I call on Margaret Mitchell to be followed by Shona Robertson. Thank you. Presiding officer. <laughs> Antisocial behaviour, whilst often referred to as nuisance crime, can have severe and deep seated adverse effects on individuals, families, and local communities. It can take many forms, ranging from vandalism, drunken behaviour, to verbal abuse. This behaviour is intensified for council tenants and owner occupiers living in flats, as the following two examples from my casework demonstrate. The first concerns an elderly lady who lived peacefully alone in her privately owned flat. Then the flat below was rented to individuals who used communal garden from morning to night to drink, smoke and swear. When my constituent complained, neither the letting agent nor the landlord took any action. But from then on, she was subjected to verbal, verbal, uh, verbal abuse and intimidation to the extent she became reluctant to leave her flat. The police were called and were responsive, but could only ask her to continue to monitor and report the incidents. Eventually, in consultation with her family, she had to put her flat up for sale uh, with all the stress, upheaval and expense that entails. My other example involves a constituent who had lived in her council flat for 20 years. Then a couple moved into the flat direct, uh, directly opposite her. And from then on, my constituent and other neighbours' lives became a living hell. Despite rules to the contrary, the couple kept 10 pets in the fourth floor flat. Their antisocial behaviour included shouting, abuse at residents, putting litter through their letter boxes, and playing unacceptably loud music. Several years on, the abuse continues and my constituent is now suffering from depression, which is affecting her employment. It is therefore, um, very briefly, we've got a short time, yes. Lynn, thank you, President Officer. I appreciate that and I have every sympathy with uh, the constituents, but I'm just wondering how increasing fixed penalty notices would help with that, and I'm genuinely asking. If you allow me to develop my uh, argument, then I certainly will um, answer that. It is therefore deeply concerning across Scotland that there are a thousand incidents of antisocial behaviour recorded every day. In North Lanarkshire, incidents are up by 2%, and Scotland-wide up by 5%. The government rightly states in their am amendment that measures to tackle antisocial behaviour need to include diversionary, early intervention and preventative activities, and antisocial behaviour orders were introduced by the, the Liberal Labour Coalition as part of the 2004 Antisocial Behaviour Act. 
This included provision for parenting orders as intervention to help prevent further incidents of youth antisocial behaviour. In 2009, the Scottish Government published its antisocial behaviour framework, but it's unclear what measures have been put in force as a result of this or whether parenting orders can still be used. And to answer Aileen Smith directly, in any case, there needs to be a balance between early intervention, diversionary measures and deterrent. And here, there has to be tougher, a tougher deterrent to tackle the more serious and persistent instances of antisocial behaviour, especially against a background of, according to pl the Police Federation, police being run ragged and at breaking point, frustrated they cannot respond to incidents due to a lack of resources. It is therefore for this reason the Scottish Conservatives are proposing an increase to antisocial behaviour, fixed penalties notices, which would double from £500 to £100 for the most serious antisocial behaviour crimes. I would therefore urge the Parliament to support the Conservative motion this evening. Thank you, I call Shona Robson before we move to concluding speeches. Shona Robson. Well, thank you, President Officer. Um, Antisocial behaviour is, of course, unacceptable. No one in Scotland should have to put up with, any, uh, with abuse in any form, and the definitions of antisocial behaviour uh, are wide-ranging and cover all manner of abusive behaviours. It can make people feel threatened, vulnerable, distressed, alarmed, harassed, and more. And I know all too well from my constituency caseload the impact that that can have. And we're all agreed that there is a need to tackle antisocial behaviour and, of course, its causes to prevent members of the public from uh, having to experience um, the, the fallout from antisocial behaviour. Now, of course, fixed penalty notices are one way in which Scotland can deal with antisocial behaviour. There are £50 on-the-spot fines for minor offences issued by Police Scotland form an important deterrent against offending and discourage repeat offences. And of course, they're already raised to £75 if not paid within 28 days. And fines are also uh, steeper for other uh, offences. Uh, and these steeper penalties reflect the seriousness of those offences. To this end, the existing policy approach already adheres to the, the tiered system which Liam Kerr's motion uh, appears uh, to seek. But but um, they're not the only way Scotland can tackle antisocial behaviour. For a start, these penalties are issued after an offence has taken place. That could certainly act as a deterrent, but to truly tackle antisocial behaviour, we need to tackle the root causes of it. And that's what the Scottish Government is doing. Cashback for communities, for example, is a, a good example of that approach, reinvesting money seized from criminals directly into community initiatives for young people in local communities across Scotland by targeting support in areas of deprivation and social exclusion uh, with risks of becoming involved in antisocial behaviour from a young age um, being higher. That's supported with £92 million of Scottish Government support uh, since 2008, and it's been able to deliver almost 2 million positive opportunities and activities for young people across Scotland in uh, Dundee. This has meant over uh, £2.5 million being spent on projects, creating around 62,000 activities for young people in local communities, including sport, diversionary youth work, and creating initiatives in partnership with Creative Scotland. Yes, of course. Liam Kerr. I actually agree with a lot of what Shona Robertson's uh, saying in the general thrust, but uh, off the top of my head, I think there are still 43 incidents of antisocial behaviour every day in Dundee. So doesn't she at least agree that we should be trying something more like the two-tier system? Shona Robertson. Well, I'm not sure, as many others have said, that there is an evidence base for that working. I think where there is an evidence base is that those diversionary activities and actually tackling the, the causes of offending uh, actually works. So I think we in this parliament should follow the evidence. I don't think there is a strong evidence base. But of course, the fixed penalty notices, as I said at the beginning of my speech, are already part of the tools that, that can be deployed. But I think tackling the causes is absolutely key here. Um, research uh, has shown, of course, that, that more adults feel safer. They, for example, they feel safer walking home after dark. The Scottish Crime and Justice Survey um, and the Scottish Household Survey 
uh, shows us uh, that the number of adults who believe antisocial behaviour is an issue in their area has dropped substantially. Fewer adults are seeing or experiencing vandalism or violence, and that is a, a good thing. And that, of course, goes beyond uh, simply issuing fixed penalty notices. That's not to say, as I've said already, that they don't play an important role in tackling crime. Uh, they, of course, do. Uh, but uh, these uh, other uh, areas are um, absolutely uh, critical. I think the point has also been made by a number of uh, members um, that given the, the age of austerity that we live in, food bank use and rent arrears uh, being uh, up, the rollout of universal credit and its impact mean that there are for many in areas of deprivation and poverty and those on low income struggling to make ends meet, it could be very difficult for those who have uh, committed an offence to pay a higher fine. And what we don't want, and I'm sure Liam Kerr would, would accept this, what we don't want is individuals becoming trapped in the justice system and unable to escape it um, where we can uh, avoid that. So, yes, of course, fixed include. penalty notice are, notices are issued on a discretionary basis by the police. Um, and um, that is an important point to remember. And we would all agree yes, that the could conclude, please. should have uh, the powers that they need to do their job effectively and help protect uh, the public. So I think, as many have said, this is a, a more complex issue beyond fixed penalty notices, and that's why it needs to be seen in the context of that in this debate. Thank you very much. And we move now to closing speeches. I call Daniel Johnson to conclude for Labour. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think this has been an interesting, useful debate. And I think there's been both agreement and disagreement. So let me start with what I think we all agree on. And first of all, is that early intervention is important. It's important that we intervene on behaviours before they escalate to the point that they're criminal. Likewise, I think we all recognise that the vast bulk of what the police actually do day to day probably isn't in the sphere of criminality. Therefore, giving them the tools they need to intervene is clearly important. The divergence is whether or not the simple proposal that we have brought forward by the Conservatives this evening is sufficient or evidenced. And I don't think it is evidenced. And it's why I have uh, sought to, to amend this motion so that it's about considering this but within a much broader context of other measures that we should, because I don't think that we can support the un unequivocally an increase. I think there is a need to review these orders and indeed perhaps a need to look at the level of fines, but not without looking at evidence. And that is where I think the first point of divergence occurs. And let me just highlight one point. I think on both, on various sides of the chamber through this afternoon, the numbers of these orders uh, issued have been used as evidence of either success or failure, that the, the decline of the, the use of these orders uh, as a sign of failure from the Conservatives, and indeed the very same number of sign of, of evidence that crime is declining. I think it's much more complicated than that. Yes, it could be a sign uh, that they're not being used, used properly, uh, but I can I also suggest perhaps that it may also be a sign that the police simply don't have the time in order to deal with these issues because they're having to deal with other higher priority issues. And it, but it is complicated and I wouldn't like to say that definitively. What we do need is evidence. Likewise, I, I thought we had some good contributions um, from a number of members about whether or not an increase really would improve a deterrence. As John Finney pointed out, if you're talking about dealing with someone who's drunk and disorderly, does a doubling the fine actually uh, alter their behavior at all? I'm not sure it does. And likewise, I thought Richard Lyle put it very well that if you double the fine and increase the chances of non-payment and thus bringing someone into the sphere of the courts and criminality, are we making the problem worse? And these are the things that I think we need to consider before you would want to say definitively, one way or another, whether you'd want to, to bring forward a proposal like this. I think the second point of divergence is, is around the, the logic about how this works. And I think we do need to take care. I think, as Liam MacArthur pointed out, we, we do need to question whether or not there's a need for, 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 for more serious behaviours and whether or not actually just the police powers of escalation are sufficient. I think that's an open question and one that would need to be probed. And likewise, again, just referring to John Finney's comments, I think the very fact that these are summary and don't have any form of appeal or redress, I mean, I think these are useful orders, but they are summary and, and I think complex, and so we need to take care before we do. But finally, I would just like to point out the context. And I think that it is impossible to talk about these things without looking at the wider social context in which these behaviours and indeed criminality takes place. Poverty is the biggest single factor and contributory factor uh, to crime. 
Uh, disadvantage and inequality are the, the, the things that we should be focusing on if we want to tackle crime. And I would say to both parties who, rep who represent governments in this chamber to think very carefully about whether or not the decisions their parties are making are helping or hindering tackling these wider issues, whether cuts in social security actually improve the, the, the ability and the social context. And likewise, the cuts in local services in this city, over £40 million worth of cuts are being considered to local services. And I would just gently say to both parties, think whether or not you are making it easier or harder to tackle crime in making those decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Ashton to wind up for the government. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I've listened to this afternoon's discussion with great interest, and I'm pleased that there is so much commitment across the chamber to tackling antisocial behaviour, although there is some divergence, as outlined by Daniel Johnson, in the ways to do that. I, like others in the chamber this afternoon, I'm not entirely clear on what the Conservatives are suggesting. There was quite a lack of detail in their proposal put forward this afternoon. Liam Kerr's motion suggests that a higher level of fixed penalty notice for more serious antisocial behaviour, as he describes it, but many, if not all, acts that could be referred to as more serious antisocial behaviour are, in fact, already likely to attract criminal charges, which, in those cases, would be the appropriate police response. When considering whether there are benefits to change, we also need to make sure that the evidence supports it, as mentioned by a number of speakers this afternoon, and that there is a demand for such a change by those experts who work directly on these issues, and that we consider the consequences, both intended and unintended, fully before we move forward. But let us be in no doubt, we need to be taking a smart justice approach to resolving all of our social issues, and it's wrong to believe that a welfare-based approach means that people are not being held to account for their actions. It actually means that interventions are designed to divert the individual from a path that could lead to a life of crime so that instead they can make a positive contribution to our country and also our future. Fixed penalty notices have a role to play here, of course, but let us first and foremost be clear that our aim is to apply the intervention which will have the best outcome for society as a whole. So statistics published yesterday on criminal proceedings in Scotland show a further decline in the use of antisocial behaviour fixed penalty notices. And while operational policing is, of course, a matter for Police Scotland and prosecution policy is a matter for the Crown, um, those who work closely with Police Scotland to ensure effective approaches in enforcing justice are taken. Such a decrease indicates, may indicate that our justice partners are looking at other ways to deal with and tackle antisocial behaviour. And it's absolutely right that partners should look at the effectiveness of different approaches and adjust these when more effective interventions are identified. And we do not believe that a one-size-fits-all approach to tackling antisocial behaviour is appropriate. Liam Kerr. Thank the Minister for taking the intervention. Minister, there were 41,500 incidents of antisocial behaviour in Edinburgh last year. That is 2,000 more than the previous year. Does the Minister think that's acceptable? And if not, shouldn't we at least try a two-tier approach? Yeah. Minister. Again, the lack of clarity on the Conservative proposals mean it's not something we could support at this point. I would also, I have some issue with the statistics that many across the Conservative benches are using this afternoon because I cannot see that in my own statistics. The long-term trend for antisocial behaviour is down. I know that the Conservatives, and I hear the Conservatives are laughing, the Conservatives like to use um, data from um, police reports, police force reports, which did show a slight increase last year. But this um, report from the first quarter this year shows that reports are down again. So that's why it's important to look at the overall long-term trend, which is down, which doesn't support what the Conservatives have been saying this afternoon. So, presiding officer, we recognise that antisocial behaviour doesn't remain static, that delivery partners need to continuously assess the best approaches available to encourage perpetrators to change their behaviour and to secure further reductions in offending through smart justice responses. And again, I can assure the Chamber that we remain absolutely committed to ensuring that police and local authorities have the power and resources to further reduce antisocial behaviour, which is why our approach to tackling antisocial behaviour is constantly kept under review. However, we remain confident that maintaining the focus on prevention and continuing to support delivery through partnership of the antisocial behaviour framework and the many other initiatives that are being taken forward by our partners 
in communities across Scotland will provide the best chance of improvement for the quality of life for everybody in all of our communities. And let's not forget that all available evidence shows a long-term reduction in violent crime in Scotland, reconviction rates that are at their lowest level in the last 19 years, and recorded crime in Scotland is at the second lowest level since 1974. And these achievements are the result of taking a smart justice approach, an approach that is based on evidence, it's based on partnership working, recognising that one size does not fit all and that delivering positive outcomes for communities and society as a whole is what will deliver the Scotland that we all want to see. Thank you very much. And I call on Michelle Ballantyne to conclude our debate. Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My colleague Liam Kerr brought his motion before this chamber today for one simple reason. Antisocial behaviour is rising and is not a victimless crime. Every day across Scotland, people of all ages are experiencing irritation, frustration, and in some cases, fear, because individuals feel free to impose their socially unacceptable behaviours on others with impunity. Margaret Mitchell gave two examples of how social be antisocial behaviour can destroy lives. And following that, Liam MacArthur and Rona Mackay all said they did not understand the motion or why it had been brought, and the suggestion appeared to be that there isn't really any issue to tackle. Um, then, then, straight afterwards, we heard from Claire Baker, who described the impact of the misuse of off-road bikes. And it seems to me that a more significant fixed penalty notice would be perfect in that case. Liam Kerr has eloquently laid out the need for on-the-spot fines for certain categories of antisocial behaviour. And our motion today is a simple proposition that the single, not, not right now, that the single fine is too blunt an instrument to tackle such a complex issue. It doesn't allow the police to differentiate between low-level antisocial behaviour and a more serious incident that doesn't require then using court intervention. And we have heard that in other nations in the UK, there is a two-tier system which gives officers greater discretion to deal with offenders, and this has attracted interest from Police Scotland. Now, there seems to be, in all the discussion here, and there's a hell of a lot of discussion going on right now, that actually, somehow, that antisocial behaviour is always around offenders who need great intervention. Quite often, it's individuals on a drunken night out, it is people hanging around in town that aren't set down on a life of crime, but their behaviour on that night causes significant concerns to the communities in which they live or the other people around them. And actually, the whole point about fixed penalty notices is that it sends them a clear message on that day without any subsequent consequences that they should not behave like that. Yes, OK. Minister Ashton. I would just like the member to explain in clear detail so that the whole chamber can understand, she can lay out the evidence, why increasing the penalty would make any difference in the way that she's suggesting to the level of antisocial behaviour. And if the chamber would listen, that would also be helpful. Michelle Ballantyne. Yes, wouldn't it just? OK, Police Scotland statistics. Um, you probably don't have these in front of you from what you said earlier. 343,570 incidents for antisocial behaviour in the last year. That's 940 incidents a day. So can we really argue that there no, needs no action whatsoever? And according to the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey, 63% of all crimes in Scotland go unreported. So if that is correct, and I'm sorry if you don't have that figure in front of you, then what we are seeing in the official figures for antisocial behaviour is only the tip of a very large iceberg. Presiding officer, of course it's important to remember that antisocial behaviour is closely linked to other factors in our communities. And Daniel Johnson talked a lot about that in his contribution, um, as indeed did the minister in her opening remarks. And she talked about the benefit of early intervention. Well, I can tell the minister that I was one of the original members of the early and effective intervention team in my local area. So I have no problem supporting what the government has done around that. It does work, and it is a super process for taking people who are on the edge of early crime into a system that will prevent them going down the crime route. That is not what this motion is about. 
this motion is about those one-off antisocial behaviours where people need to understand that it is not acceptable. Now, I suspect I'm going to run out of time the way things are going, yeah, because <laughs> this has all dragged on somewhat. Um, I think that really, in summing up of this, I understand that across the chamber, people are arguing that they're a wee bit confused, they don't really understand this. So can we bring it back to a point of clarity? We do have an antisocial, um, antisocial behaviour problem in Scotland. In fact, most countries do. This is about whether we can tackle it effectively. The government have brought forward some good policies, and I, I support those policies, as does the rest of my benches. This is not a criticism of what you have done to date. This is about how the police on the ground can tackle incidences of antisocial behaviour without dragging them into the court system, without making them part of an early and effective intervention system. This is about sending a clear message to those off-road bikers you do not come here again. You do not do this again. And actually, the current level of fine is worth it to get your off-road bike out for the day. And some people will happily pay that. A higher level of fine will make them weigh that up and say, do I really want to pay that amount for coming out on my bike? That is the point of this motion. We are asking the government to, to support raising are having a higher level of fine that is appropriate for antisocial behaviour. It is a simple ask. If the answer is no, what you're really saying, I think, is you recognise the problem, but you're not willing to take the action. So we will support the Labour Amendment today. I support a lot of what you've said around the wider issues, and it has been mentioned by the others. But we would hope that the government would consider this, not just reject it out of hand by talking about their other actions that they've taken. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on tackling antisocial behaviour. The next item is consideration of business motion 15623 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau setting out a business programme. Could I call on Graham Day to move the motion? Moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And no one has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 15623 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item is consideration of business motion 15621. Also in the name of Graeme Day, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, on the Stage 1 timetable for a bill, could I call on Graeme Day to move that motion? Moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And no one has asked to speak against that motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 15621 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. The next item is consideration of Bureau motion 15622 on approval of an SSI. And again, could I ask Graeme Day to move this motion on behalf of the Bureau? Moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much. Now we come to decision time. The first question today is that Amendment 15607.2 in the name of John Swinney, which seeks to amend Motion 15607 in the name of Liz Smith on the presumption to mainstream, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that Amendment 15607.1 in the name of Ian Gray, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Liz Smith, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We we'll move to a division on that motion and amendment and members be cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 15607.1 in the name of Ian Gray is yes, 27, no, 92. There were no abstentions and the amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that motion 15607 in the name of Liz Smith as amended on the presumption to mainstream be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Now, in the fourth question, I would remind members that if the amendment in the name of Ash Denham is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Daniel Johnson will fall. The question is that amendment 15615.2 in the name of Ash Denham, which seeks to amend motion 15615 in the name of Liam Kerr on tackling antisocial behaviour, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. 
We move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 15615.2 in the name of Ash Denham is yes, 69, no, 50. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The amendment in the name of Daniel Johnson therefore falls. And the next question is that motion 15615 in the name of Liam Kerr, as amended on, as amended on tackling antisocial behaviour, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. And the final question, is that motion 15622 in the name of Graham Day on approval of an SSI be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Now we're going to move now to, that concludes decision time, and we're going to move to members' business in the name of Gail Ross on equally safe at work. But we'll just take a few moments for members and the Minister to change seats. <laughs>